your schedule and your, your thinking. Uh, the Olympics ended last week for the two weeks before. Um, I'm sure all of us were uh, at least exposed, saw some of them, if not quite a bit. And it's always interesting to look at, uh, at all of the different kinds of events. I'm sure you have your favorites and maybe your unfavorites. We won't go into that. But it really is interesting to see how those medals are awarded in the Olympics. And it varies from the, the very objective, score the most points, jump or throw the farthest, the highest, run the fastest. But then there are those events that are judged by scores given by judges on the basis of performance. And I have to confess that with the exception of somebody just, you know, doing a belly flop off of the high board or uh, falling in a tumbling uh, routine, I often really struggle to tell the difference between that performance and that performance. But I'm not the only one. Sometimes the expert commentators also have difficulty de thinking, well, I don't know if that, that, that score was really, really suitable to the performance in the, uh, the particular judged activity. And you know, life is like that. We often struggle to reconcile performances with results, at least sometimes. Generally, it's pretty clear, but, but we often struggle to reconcile an evaluation of a performance with the outcome of the performance in a negative or a positive direction. And the book of Proverbs um, has traditionally pr presented some problems in that regard. And let me illustrate with uh, a well-known proverb a proverb which has probably caused somebody in this room difficulties, if not more than somebody. And it's the proverb that goes, raise up a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Anybody ever been troubled by that proverb as you applied it to a particular situation or set of parents? Yeah, because you have, uh, you know, godly parents who will raise a brood of children. And one of them is a rotten egg. They don't go the right way. And there is no difference in the raising of the children and their godly parents. And you would just expect that their parenting would have good results. And yet, in one case, it does, and in another case, it doesn't. And what do we do with that? And that's what I want to talk about today, is the whole issue of whether or not Proverbs should be considered as promises, so that we can always correlate outcomes with performance. That really is the issue that I want to get at today. And in doing so, it will help us further understand how Proverbs work and hopefully encourage us more to make this book a, a part of our lives. The upper right hand corner of your notes there is a, uh, uh, a slide that I use in uh, teaching this course. And you'll notice that in the left hand side is a, is a stooped over person, you know, in a very dejected uh, pose. And in the upper right hand corner is a group of judges holding up zeros. Because you see, we do judge ourselves and others on the basis of outcomes. And sometimes they may not be accurate with regard to the performance. And so I want to look at this interpretive guideline in the book of Proverbs regarding uh, uh, the uh, assumption of the question, are Proverbs promises? There are some proper assumptions about proverbial wisdom that we should make and, and remember. First of all, it assumes a fundamental relationship 
between the natural and the social moral order. That is the order that we find in nature and what we find in terms of human society and families just, just as we find them, apart from God even. Uh, Proverbs 3, 19 to 20 says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths were broken up. The clouds dropped down the dew. In other words, wisdom and understanding and knowledge are key terms in the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs says that it is the, the wisdom, the skill of, of living and, and giving understanding as to how things work. And giving uh, the ability to make wise choices. Well, that's the way we're to live. And it says that God created the natural order of things by those qualities. And they exhibit that. So there is a relationship. Secondly, there's a solidarity between all parts of God's creation. So that what is observed in the natural cosmos, the natural order of created things, has implications for understanding the social moral order of man. So 6.6 six says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. And we find this many times in the book of Proverbs. That God uses a lesson from an animal or some process in the natural uh, creation to teach something about the way life should be conducted. So the society of ants has some positive correlation to the society of man. Now, we might not necessarily expect that, though all people observe it. But when we ask, well, why is that? Because we're all evolved from the same thing, right? No, because we come from the same creator. And so he has built everything according to a plan and a, and a pattern. And he has worked his wisdom into the ways of all things. And so the book proceeds on the fact that you can learn something from ants. You can learn something from rock badgers. You can learn something from the natural order of things, the way clouds operate and so forth. And, uh, and we have to keep that in mind. It, it tells us a lot about God's intention for this book. So it assumes a fundamental relationship between the natural and the social moral order of things. It also assumes that the physical and moral universe operates by cause and effect. That generally we can trace causes and effects. There are analogies and comparisons between animal life and human experience that, that make sense. For instance, it says in chapter 30, there are three things that are never satisfied. Four that never say enough. The grave. You know, there just are never enough dead people to be buried in the, in the, in the graveyard for it to say enough. Just kind of one of those truisms. The barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire that never says enough. We have had two very nice rain showers, thunderstorms in Dubuque in the last couple of weeks. My ground is not saying enough. It wants more. Now sometimes the ground gets saturated and it says enough. But generally, uh, I mean, it things dry out. It, uh, you know, what was it, last year we had a 12 inch rain and in, in, uh, was that at least last summer? Yeah, in July I think it was. You know what? We had a drought this summer. That rain didn't satisfy the earth. The earth continually needs water. And we're to learn something from that in other areas. It also says in that chapter, there are four things which are little on the earth, but they're exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong. The rock badgers are a feeble folk. The locusts have no king. The spider skillfully grasps with its hands. It is intending to, to teach something through this natural realm, and there are analogies to that effect. 
Now, in the idea of cause and effect, what the book of Proverbs wants to point out and train us in is the fact that certain actions lead to good results in life, good outcomes, and other actions lead to poor outcomes. Uh, you will hear the term, something really wonderful happens to someone, and you might hear somebody say, well, you're really living right. Not just Christians, general populace says that. Or we have the idea of karma. Oh, I've got a bad karma day going on. What's that mean? That does not come from Christian theology, it comes from Eastern mysticism, but the idea is something I did in the past, something I did in a past life, is working itself out now. All of humanity has this, this basic understanding that there is a cause and effect relationship going on in all kinds of ways. And it is true from God's standpoint that that is what we can expect. We intuitively look for this. And the reason we look for this is that God has created the universe in an orderly way and basically in a cause and effect system. Now that doesn't mean rigorously, but basically that's what we can expect. And so there is some positive assumptions that we make about, about tying together performance and outcomes. But that's not the whole story. And we cannot rigorously depend upon that being consistent in every case. And that's where we can run into proverb, uh, problems in Proverbs. And so we need to correct some wrong assumptions about proverbial wisdom. First of all, we need to assume and, and know that proverbial wisdom is limited by its brevity and its catchiness. These are short little sayings, two-line statements where the lines re interact with each other to make a, a basic affirmation about life and how life should be lived. But no two-line statement can be fully exhaustive to anything in life, no matter how limited the perspective may be. For instance, uh, Proverbs 22.4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Now that is not to be taken as a mathematical equation. Okay, today I'm going to add a little more humility to my life because I need some money for the weekend. Doesn't work that way, does it? But that's a, a general truism. But you can't just extend it to cover everything there is about character and material well-being. There are connections in the book of Proverbs, but no one proverb is going to be able to, to unpack all of the connection. And so we have to understand that when it comes to specific proverbial statements. The second uh, uh, assumption that we need to write is that proverbs are not condoning or encouraging evil when making certain amoral observations, that is just observations without commenting on what we should do with it. For instance, in 1420 it says, the poor man is hated even by his own neighbor, but the rich has many friends. Now, this isn't saying, you know, <laughs> the reason not to be poor is because you want friends. This is not saying the way to make friends is through your money. Now there is some truth to that, and the Lord Jesus even tells a, a parable about that. But it's not really prescribing any kind of behavior. It is simply making an observation. Do you like to visit rich people or poor people? Do you like to live next to rich people or poor people? Do you like to be rich or poor? And so it's just, it's just an observation of, you know, in life, the wealthy seem to have all kinds of friends, friends that they don't even want. And the poor, well, another proverb says, you know, people stay away from his house. 17.8, a present is a precious stone in the eyes of its possessor. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Now, if you took that as prescribing a, a characteristic to build, it would say, learn to bribe. Because that's how you're going to get your way in life. 
all it's saying is bribes do work as you observe things in life. But it is not counseling the development of that quality. And so it simply makes observations about the way things work and uh, helps uh, give us some understanding. Now, if you'll flip your page over, C, Proverbs, proverbial wisdom, is not a legal guarantee from God, but rather poetic guidelines for good behavior. It tells us what is always right to do. The point is that when Proverbs makes it clear, this is the way of righteousness, this is an action or an attitude, a characteristic, a quality that puts you on the path of wisdom. You don't have to investigate the outcome. It's always right to seek counsel, for instance. But we don't always know how the resulting plans will turn out. For instance, in the right-hand column there, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Now, if you take that as a promise, you can say, well, if I make sure that I get six opinions on the choice I have before me, and they're all wise men, they're all wise people, then I can go ahead and, and be assured that, that this is going to work. If it's a promise, if Proverbs individually are promises, that's how you could proceed. But, it also says in Proverbs in 19.21, there are many plans in a man's heart, nevertheless the Lord's counsel, that will stand, and a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. You see, sometimes no matter how much planning we do, sometimes no matter how many wise people we ask, and we proceed with the certainty that this is the best course of action. And Proverbs and the Bible underscores it as the best course of action. The result isn't what I anticipated. Does that mean Proverbs has failed? Well, as we're going to see, that is not what it means. So what we can say from Proverbs is, is that Proverbs tells us what is right behavior. That right behavior is not determined by outcome, but by the revelation of God. When he says, this is what you should do with your tongue, that's what we should do with our tongue. When it says, don't speak this way, we know that we should not speak that way. And while there are suggested outcomes that we can expect, if something else happens, we don't have to say, well, that must not be true because I did not get the outcome I expected. Isn't it sad how often in the Christian life we approach the Word of God like that? Well, that didn't work, must not be true. If God said it, and God prescribed it or prohibited it, that is truth. And that's what we're obligated to. Now that brings us to the key point, and that's D in your notes. Proverbial wisdom tells us what generally takes place without making an irreversible rule. It puts forth a generally true principle that depends on the right time and circumstances. It's Thanksgiving. All the, the, the family is together in, in, in the big house, you know. You know, grandma, grandpa, the children, the children's children, the families, they're just people all over the place. The men are in the living room watching football. The ladies are in the kitchen. Now, I know that's a gross gender exaggeration, but go with it for the illustration. And from the kitchen, it is heard in the unmistakable voice of grandma, too many cooks spoil the broth. Now, it is not hard to interpret that. What is she saying? Y'all get out of here. I'm going to make the gravy my way. There are too many people in here. Same house, same day, two hours later. The turkey has been consumed. The men are in the living room with the TV on, sleeping. 
as the football game proceeds without them. And from the kitchen, in the unmistakable voice of grandma, is heard, many hands make light work. In other words, the kitchen is not full enough. Get in here, you slumbering men who need to do your part now. Help with the dishes. All right, same house, same situation, but different circumstance, the phrase me, may, you know, makes sense. All right? She doesn't say that when the gravy's being made. Many hands make light work. She's saying too many hands spoil the broth. Each of those is true, giving its setting and its occasion. And that's the way we have to understand Proverbs. And there are many here that we can illustrate. For instance, 10.1 says, A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Is that always true? Do parents always rejoice in the wisdom of their children? Well, wise parents do. Parents who have inculcated in them the way of wisdom. Parents who have trained them to follow the way of wisdom. When a child turns out wise, that is a delight. But what about a parent who does not value wisdom? A parent who may actually value the opposite of wisdom. A parent whom Proverbs would define as a fool, as a scoffer, as someone who does not like God, as someone who, who thumbs their nose at everything that God and the Bible stand for. You've probably seen it. Young person outside the church comes to Awana, listens to the gospel, trusts Christ, begins to grow, begins to change, begins to develop godly habits, and goes back home <laughs> To parents who are still in their sin and have no place for religion in their lives. Do they appreciate that child's new faith and that child's new value system and that child's desire to live in, in a way that is honoring to God? Often not. In fact, sometimes that brings an extremely hostile reaction. So you see how you can't take that as a promise. You can take it as what will happen given the right time and circumstance. That is, the parents value wisdom, then they are going to be delighted when their children adopt it. The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Is that generally true? Yeah. Is it inviolably true? No. Do you know only godly people who died at a very early age? Well, yeah. <laughs> All kinds of people. Missionaries and just people, victim of illnesses. And do you know any wicked men, women who have lived to, to ancient years, the 80s and 90s? Sure. Proverbs says that is not the general rule. Generally, righteousness extends life and wickedness shortens life. But we sometimes find the opposite. It doesn't mean that we have to then redefine the wicked person as righteous because he's old. Nor determine that the young person who died is wicked because otherwise they would have lived. That's not the point of Proverbs. So generally speaking, it depends upon other things outside the control of the one directly involved in the proverbial activity. The third one there, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. That's generally true, isn't it? You want to tell your young people, you want to tell yourself, you counsel each other, get a job that really makes a difference, that really is, is honest, solid work. And you'll benefit from that. And over the, over the long run, you'll be better off financially than, you know, going after get-rich-quick schemes and, and all of these things. But do you know any exceptions to that? Well, yeah, organized crime. 
Rich people, <laughs> they're not getting it the way Proverbs says they should. Political corruption. <sighs> Bribery. Bribery can increase the wealth of certain people. But that doesn't make Proverbs wrong when it says that's not the way to live. How about layoffs due to economic downturns from otherwise God-honoring jobs? Well, you see, Proverbs isn't intended to cover every conceivable situation. But, generally speaking, we can expect the outcome that is associated with the activity. How about 1611, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Really? Always? Can you think of any exceptions to that? It's the most notable exception about the Lord Jesus Christ. Was he a wise man? Did he ever live contrary to what Proverbs says a righteous man will do and how a righteous man will live? Never. Did he ever misspeak? Did he ever violate what Proverbs says about the proper use of the tongue? No, he's a man without sin. He pleased the Father in all ways. Were his enemies at peace with him? No. They persecuted him, hounded him, and then put him to death as a common criminal. Do Proverbs work? They do. But we have to understand <laughs> That it depends on the right time and circumstance. The last one there, 20 to 11. He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. Unless he's a wicked king. Because wickedness does not like the companionship of righteousness. A wicked king does not want a counselor who is a righteous, upstanding person because that will be a condemnation to him every moment of his life. So you see what we're saying is, is that it's not an unconditional promise. It is a wise observation based upon revelation and experience. And that takes us back to the, def or to the uh, statement of what Proverbs is about. A collection of extended discourses and self-contained maxims which as more or less self-confirming generalizations about how life works in God's world are designed to produce in the hearer a successful life experience to the degree that such an experience depends upon his or her own choices and actions. If I'm in the Olympics and I perform better than everyone else, I could expect, should expect, to win the gold medal. But if there is a corrupt judge or two that wants instead to reward the medal to their countryman or countrywoman, I might not win the medal. But as far as I'm concerned, I have performed with excellence and should expect the excellence to be rewarded. But you see, God has placed me in a world where sometimes wrong <laughs> takes over. The last page of notes there it just puts that all into perspective. So we're suggesting is that proverbial wisdom is balanced by the entire collection of biblical wisdom which includes not only the book of Proverbs and some of the proverbial statements and Psalms, but the books of Job and Ecclesiastes. Their wisdom literature as well. Proverbs deals with the built-in regularities which make nine-tenths of life manageable, whereas Job and Ecclesiastes deal with the one-tenth of life that is utterly inexplicable. And you need both of those together 
to understand how to live in this world. In Job, one of his detractors says, But now it comes upon you, it, that is, this, this curse, and you're weary. It touches you and you're troubled. Is not your reverence, your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? In other words, Job, you seem and outwardly say you're a man of integrity, but you're suffering, and that proves that you deserve it. Now, we know from what goes on in the book that Job did not deserve his fate, but his friends say he did. Because you see, they were judging his performance by his experience, by his immediate result of the living of life in that instant where he was suffering in all kinds of ways. And working backwards, they assumed and concluded he was not a wise man, but a sinner. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, well, a lot of people perished being innocent. <laughs> Book of Hebrews talks about people who by faith were sawn in two and, and, you know, killed. And Jesus Christ perished being innocent. In the book of Ecclesiastes, there's an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it's common among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires. Yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vaporous, and it's an evil affliction. And later on, Ecclesiastes, it says, well, then the race is not to the swift, nor is the battle always to the strong, is the way we should read this, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. But as we look at life and as we put all things into the pot, it seems that time and chance happen to them all. From one standpoint, we shouldn't bother with the book of Proverbs because I can't always guarantee that honest work will result in me being better off financially. Hey, my neighbor is cheating, stealing, Involved in all kinds of things. He's got two boats, three cars, four houses. I'm struggling to have one of most of those and none of some. So Proverbs really shouldn't be followed? No. The point is that the way Proverbs presents life to us, it shows us how to develop the skill of living as Jesus Christ lived in every area of life. Realizing that generally speaking, I can anticipate the results from the actions that Proverbs says to expect. But when God determines that there is going to be a contrary outcome, well, that doesn't shake me. Because he's got a bigger perspective on things and there's more going on in this thing called life than I can program into my performance. The Lord Jesus Christ violates the outcomes expected of so many behavioral proverbs. Why? Well, because it was necessary for God in those cases to allow his son to suffer. To present him and to make him a propitiation for our sins and also to give us an example of how to live when life doesn't make sense. When the performance mandated by Proverbs doesn't exactly equate with the outcome. So that's the balance in regard to wisdom and life. Proverbs is wisdom training for success because the Lord's world has order. And he does basically cause it to run according to that cause and effect relationship. But he is still free. And I can trust him with that when Proverbs don't pan out. And it doesn't make him untrue. It doesn't make the word untrue because that's the nature of what we find in the book. 
I commend to you Proverbs, I commend to you this wisdom of life that will give you understanding and will give you the ability to sort through some of the thorniest problems and issues of your life and of our times. Will give you the absolute confidence that, that this is the way, right way to proceed in this relationship, in this undertaking, in this task. Because that's how God is, that's how Jesus lived, and that's how life is to operate. And Lord, I'll expect the outcome, but if it's different, <laughs> you're still my resource. You're still there. There's a bigger picture that I don't understand but I'll accept it. I would encourage you to read in Proverbs uh, every month, every day of the year, but also read Job and Ecclesiastes at least once a year. That's the balance. That's the balance. God's world has order and he has taught us how to skillfully live within that orderly arrangement. But he's still free in regard to what he's doing. And so when life throws me a curve and I don't get the gold medal, even though I gave the best performance, I can still know that I'm pleasing the Father because I'm living as a wise child. He does value that, regardless of the outcome. Father, we do thank you for being uh, the Father who has created all things by wisdom and who delights when we are your wise children. We don't always understand how life proceeds and how causes and effects are, are related, but we do know that you are good. We can trust you in all things. Help us, Father, to model the kind of a life that the Lord Jesus Christ did, of whom it is said he became for us the wisdom of yourself. Thank you, Father, that all things are ultimately determined by you, but you give us such an understanding as to how the normal course of life is to be conducted. And may we delight you as we pursue that. And may others see the reasonableness of what you commend in becoming a wise person. And to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen.